Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Fort Talk Thursdays. My name is Erica Hartley, and I'm the Field Director and Curatorial Fellow for the Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project. Tonight's pre presentation will be the second of three in our virtual lecture series this year with the theme Archaeology and Outreach at French Forts. Each of, each of the presenters have worked at the site or used the information about the site in their research and outreach projects. I hope you're able to make it to next week's, which will be our final one for this year. The format for the talks is as follows. Each presenter will discuss their work for about 15 to 20 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. To eliminate distractions, we have um, disabled the video sharing for attendees or we're asking you to turn off your video. If you have a question or comment, please type it in the chat to me and I'll read it during the Q&A question. So will help it move a little smoother. Um, the lecture and the Q&A, as you just saw, will be recorded. Tonight, our presenter is Evan Harris a master's student in, in the Department of Anthropology at Mercyhurst University and a friend of the project. He is going to present Orphan Collections and the Curation Crisis in the Time of COVID-19, the case of Fort LaBeouf, Waterford, Pennsylvania. Fort LaBeouf site showcases many issues in the curation crisis, as he'll detail. This project aimed to establish a chronology of excavations at Fort LaBeouf to locate and summarize archaeological reports and to determine the locations of associated artifact collections, visiting the relevant institutions to study and determine the state of the collections is a vital component of this research. Communication and access to various institutions, housing the excavation materials was further compounded by COVID-19 restrictions. Welcome tonight, Evan. Thank you so much for participating in this series and please feel free to begin. All right. Um, so that's my introduction. Again, I'm Evan Harris, master's student at Mercyhurst University. Hope everyone's doing well. Not too snowed in. Um, title of my, lengthy title of my thesis here has just been read. And uh, first slide here, I've got a nice 1750s drawing of Fort LaBeouf. Fort LaBeouf was built in 1753 and the French built a line of forts, Fort Presque Isle in Erie, Pennsylvania. Fort LaBeouf and Fort Michaud um, was a defensive line which terminated further down the Allegheny River at, uh, in what is now Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with um, Fort Duquesne. And you can see the map here, you've got the three of those forts mentioned and a little inset the, for the part of the country we're talking about. And so I've got my project goals, which Erica just read off here. So of course, determining the locations, archeological reports related to past excavations, so on and so forth. And so initially my plan was to do my master's thesis, just a short and sweet, simple ceramics analysis of artifact ceramics from Fort LaBeouf. And um, over the last couple of years, I, started looking around, okay, ceramics, no problem. Where are they, ceramics? And in speaking to uh, professors and others at Mercier's University, nobody really knew where these things were exactly. So Fort LaBeouf is located in Waterford, Pennsylvania, which is about 20 minutes from Mercier's University. And the reason it was built, you can see here, Fort LaBeouf is a, portage from Presque Isle. So the French were able to move troops and other goods. This was to, to defend this part of the, the country from, or their territory, New France. Um, they can move goods from Canada to Fort Presque Isle, move it across Lake Erie. And then there's a 10 mile portage to Fort LaBeouf. So Fort LaBeouf was that, was actually on Fort or LaBeouf Creek, which flows into French Creek, flows into Allegheny River, which flows into Ohio River at Pittsburgh. So it's about 10 miles from Erie, Pennsylvania, what is now Erie, Pennsylvania. So it's right outside of Erie, which of course was where Mercyhurst is. And so it's pretty much in the backyard of Mercyhurst University, but no one really knew where these, when it had been excavated or where the artifacts were. In Waterford, Pennsylvania, there's a Waterford Museum, but they had had all their artifacts um, 
it had been a state-run museum and the artifacts had been moved to state facilities. So what started out was kind of a simple ceramics analysis or was hoping, that's what I was hoping for, it ended up being more of a commentary on the curation crisis. So this is kind of what I was just talking about here. Um, French built a series of forts to defend that section of New France. And um, one of the big events that occurred there, it was built in 1753. And at the end of the summer, it was finished. By Christmas, or actually October 31st, George Washington departed Williamsburg, Virginia with a note from the governor of Virginia to inform the French that they were trespassing on British lands. Of course, the British were expanding westward and the French were had the Ohio country along the Mississippi and the Ohio River, and of course, the Great Lakes in Canada. And the Ohio country, like, in this area was kind of contested by both the British and the French. So for George Washington was sent there along with uh, indigenous peoples and some traders and various other guides to deliver a letter to the French commander saying, hey, you're trespassing on British soil, um, time to leave. And of course he arrived there in late December the French were like, okay, well, that's that's fine, but <laughs> we don't really have the authority to do that. And of course, these events led quickly into the French and Indian War. And you can see my little timeline here, Fort 1753, the fort was built, George Washington visited it. Um, there was never any fighting there. The fort was just part of the supply line moving troops from the Great Lakes to Fort Duquesne and back and forth. And in 1759, the French realized that their position was untenable with the loss of Fort Niagara on Lake Ontario. So they retreated and burned all the forts in that line. And then the next year, the British arrived there, rebuilt the fort. And then French and Indian War was over a few years later. Um, the fort was burned in Pontiac's War. Kind of an interesting story there. There were only a handful of British troops there. And um, they were supposedly, all of them were able to escape while the fort was burning through what I've read was called a secret tunnel, but was probably just a drainage ditch, hard to say. But, um, and then, and so the fort just, or while there was no fort any, there anymore. In 1794, American forces built a new fort on pretty much the exact, exact same spot, but a little slightly offset from it. And those structures, some of them at least, stood until 1868. They were used, repurposed by the town that was growing there in the late 18th century. And um, eventually the last part of that was burned in 1868. Then in 1922, um, is kind of all across the country, um, kind of a historical revival, revival was happening. And the daughters of the American colonists uh, purchased the land, which apparently was going to be uh, turned into a gas station, part of the land, because it was now a pretty prominent road was running right through what, you know, the town now was Waterford and a, a decent sized road was put right on top of where the fort had stood. Whatever the case, the Daughters of the American Colonists purchased the land and built uh, a park there. And they put up a statue and things commemorating George Washington. I've got good pictures of all this stuff. And then, of course, modern interest. 1936 and 1937, the WPA um, CCC type things were was excavated by um, people, one archaeologist and a bunch of guys digging. So in general, speaking to everyone that was aware of the fort, knew about the 1930s excavations, and they also knew that I was told in the 70s or 80s or 90s, nobody really knew for sure that Edinburgh, Edinburgh University had excavated there. But there, I didn't really have any specifics about that. And so I started trying to contact the professor that had done these because I heard it was field schools but again nobody really knew exactly when where or who 
So I started emailing people from Edinburgh University. Edinburgh University is not in Scotland. It's actually about 20 minutes outside of Erie, Pennsylvania. And um, I'm not really sure. I guess they had more of an interest in colonial type excavations than Mercyhurst University did at the time. So through several emails later, now this is during COVID. So most emails that were sent to the state or to other universities were immediate out of office reply. Our offices are closed for COVID, so, so on and so forth. This is right at the beginning of COVID. Um, yeah. So the, it turned out, I spoke to the department head there and they said, oh, well, the person you're trying to get to is gone and no one knows how to get in touch with them. Which I was like, whoa, really? Okay, that's <laughs> odd. And so I was put in touch with someone else and they were able, they said, well, we have all these artifacts. I'm not sure when it was excavated, but we have them. But you can't get into that building until COVID's over. So you might want to try and do your master's on something else. So that was kind of, that was, you know, a year into all this or pretty close to it. And I was like, well, yeah, um, well, that's going to be a problem. So, oh, well, maybe you can just wait until the spring or the next fall. So long story short, I was a, eventually able to get into the Edinburgh University and have a look at their collection. As far as the state went, I spoke with a um, representative of the state repository, like Pennsylvania State Museum. And um, I had a lot of trouble getting in touch with anyone from there because of COVID. And just, I think a lot of people were, you know, were staying home in general. And so I did find out that there are artifacts held by the state, but that's, I'll get to that in a minute. So moving on, Burroughs University, Fort Bluff Museum. So this is actually a drawing put together by one of the state archeologists, Janet Johnson. And then this is an overlay of the original WPA uh, excavation map. And so you see here in the 1930s, it, Waterford, Pennsylvania hasn't changed a ton since then. Most of these structures still stand. And what Dr. Johnson was did here was superimpose um, her ideas of where the two forts stood. So that, of course, the French fort, the gray and kind of diamond in the middle, and then, of course, the British fort. And the main road goes right here, right through the middle of it, cross streets. And then the Daughters of the American colonists purchased this lot right here. A prominent building, which was built in a hotel, built in 1826, is here. And then another house, which now is called the Judson House, was built here. These are all right on top of where the forts stood. And then the actual museum, the Fort LeBuff Museum is about here, which was built in 1970. And I did kind of my own map using Google Earth. And uh, what I what's represented here is only the French portion or the French version of the fort. And um, so that's our best guess. So again, you can see here, Fort LeBuff Museum. Eagle Hotel is here on the left, Judson House is here on the right. And this here, you can just see Fort LeBeouf Creek, which soon turns into French Creek. This is mislabeled, actually, because French Creek starts right here. But this is where was the first spot that canoes were able to be put in the water there to at the end of the portage so that goods and troops could be moved down down the river. So for uh, George Washington visited right here and probably put a canoe or boat in the in the water here. British maps and French maps show the creek has the exact same curve to it, has not changed much at all since the 1750s. So on um, this here is the Judson House, as you can, I don't know if you can read that or not. And this is the Eagle Hotel. 1826, 1808, these were some of the first structures built in Waterford. And of course, the American version of the fort was built in 1794. And these are right on top, right in the middle of where the fort was. 
pretty nice structures. This, I think at the time was one of the largest stone buildings in, um, in Pennsylvania. Lafayette visited there much later <laughs> after he was retired. And actually both of these structures are owned by the Waterford Historical Society. So they're essentially museums. The Judson House is all museum. The Eagle Hotel, the second and third floors are museum. The first floor is a really neat hotel, um, restaurant. No hotel there anymore, but they still call it that. And then this is the, the lot that the Daughters of the American uh, Colonists purchased. In here, you can see kind of the back of the Eagle Hotel and some structures here, probably a storage shed. There was once a, an outdoor kitchen here and commemorative statue of young George Washington here. Of course, yeah, I think he was 23 when he visited Fort LaBeouf. And this is talking about when this, the daughters of the American colonists kind of built this and dedicated everything to, to George Washington. And actually this area here, this lot, you can't see it well. It's hard to get good pictures because there's a lot of trees there. But that was actually where the American blockhouse stood. And that was cleared out. And there was a cellar which was filled in when they made that park. And you can still see where there was a well and this kind of the tops of what was what were basement foundations there. And there's historical plaques things of that nature, French, British, American flags there, all that good stuff. This is essentially, if you stand in the middle of the, the square here and turn around, you can see these three views. So 1936 and 37, the WPA excavated there, as I previously mentioned. And the picture on the right, I was able to, that's been around, but the picture on the left, I only found in Edinburgh archives. So the professor which had, been in charge of the excavations and what turned out to be just field schools at Fort LaBeouf had retired and moved away and out of contact with everyone. So the person that's in charge there now, I, once I was able to get into this collection in, let's see, September, I, it was just kind of a disarray of various items and um, some of the there were boxes of pictures it seemed as if a desk had been cleared out everything thrown in a couple bankers boxes just all documents and photos slides various reports someone picked up their stuff out of a desk drawer threw it in a banker's box and then threw it in this room along with and of course you'll see the artifacts here in a minute but a couple these photos that i was able to find really didn't have any clues to exactly when they were taken or who took them or anything other than the context I found them in. But um, this guy looks a little nervous. I don't know. I would be in that huge trench. <laughs> Hard to say where that is, but presumably it's part of those excavations. Can't be sure. Not sure if that meets OSHA regulations by today's standards. So this is Edinburgh University and all of the artifacts are in one room. And um, the room is currently used for various other things. The current curator um, has done archeology, span but is more of a forensics based um, person. So little work has been done with this collection. Um, some digital uh, work has been done. There was an undergrad student that was attempting to catalog artifacts in an Excel spreadsheet, but you know they're probably only putting in minimal time. And so, and they they're not really trained in curation. <laughs> so, it's it's not it's a good start. But as you can see here, so this is the left kind of the left side of the room. If you turn to the right, you see this. There's more things on all sides, but this was the bulk of it. And these small white boxes here, there, everywhere is 2,322, what they essentially are cigar boxes in that the flat, they're the same size and the flap is attached with paper, but therefore, I guess things like this. 
And of course, there's a lot of banker boxes, 79, and 45 other boxes. And then just sitting on shelves or in the corner, you name it, there's a few other loose artifacts, like let's say less than 10. And um, so it was in pretty good shape. It's not really messy. They've, you know, students do projects in here. So there are some, this, the things on this table here are not related to the artifacts from Fort LaVeouf. But um, from what I understood, one student had done, I think, a poster for on bottles. So they had just kind of randomly gone through and picked out all the bottles from all these boxes, which are labeled and studied them and then put them all in one box, which is in the corner. And then a similar thing was done with some faunal remains. And um, so moving right along, so here's kind of a close up on some of the boxes. And most of them are labeled just like this. Um, these are some pretty good examples. You can see here where some of the writing is kind of rubbing off. It turned out the excavations were conducted from 1975 to 1987. And I only found this out from pouring over the files. And then you can kind of extrapolate that information by looking at the dates that are on these boxes. But um, some of the ballpoint ink is rubbing off. Some of it was done in marker. Some of it was good handwriting. Some of it was sketchy handwriting. Um, so it's all there, but they're not, they look like they might be in order, but they're not, not even close. And actually, <laughs> while I was, I went there four or five times in the fourth time, I think, they had cleaned up the room and moved everything around to consolidate all the boxes. So what order they had been was no, you know, not <laughs> applicable anymore. So that's just a few of them. You can kind of, the information isn't necessarily consistent from box to box. So there's all this information isn't recorded digitally. It's from the 70s and 80s and the students had recorded everything on index cards, which are in a library style, but actually that when they closed, or I guess Edinburgh University went digital as all libraries have done or most, and they had these card catalogs. So all the index cards went into this giant card catalog. Now those drawers are like a foot and a half deep. And I'm sure everyone here, or most everyone here has probably used these. They're, and there's 149,800 and something or other of these cards, 150,000 index cards. Each one represents one artifact. And each card has a description and on the back a drawing. This is the flipped over version of this. So the students were kept pretty busy by that for quite some time. And I attempted to find, locate individual artifacts um, based on index cards. And I wasn't unable to, because you're looking at an artifact number. So you have to look at the range of the artifacts for these boxes. And it could be done eventually, but it's out of order, needs a little help. So it would be inefficient to study <laughs> artifacts, they're not organized by type, material, anything. So even if I wanted to, I was hoping to be able to at least look at ceramics, but you would just have to pretty much start opening boxes randomly and pulling out ceramics, putting them back in the same boxes and so on, which could be done, but I <laughs> not in my time frame. And then so um, the next several slides are some of the materials that are in these archives. So there is a, a full filing cabinet with unit sheets, excavation reports. These are just some examples here. These ones are pretty nice. All of these were in good shape, good handwriting. Um, and then and there's a lot of them. There's hundreds and hundreds, a couple hundred folders. And on the left, you can see the maps from the excavations. This is as I found them. They were, had been in, apparently in someone's garage or basement. They were all smashed, a little bit of water damage. 
And then um, part of my, one of the things I did, it wasn't exactly in part of the project, but it's hard to look at these things and photograph them and document them without, you know, fixing them a little bit. So I spent a good bit of time um, unrolling these maps, flattening them out, photographing them, and then putting them in this nice map drawers that they had. And then some of the maps are pretty nice, um, especially the ones from 75, 76. Um, I'm not, they were done, you know, pretty high quality stuff here. This one had been mushed a little. Um, nice profile drawings there. Um, this one was laminated. I think I, it was probably used for some sort of exhibit at some point. I'm not really sure. Some of the excavations that had been done there, I found out were on the property of Eagle Hotel, as you can see here. And they excavated a sister and a root cellar in a nice house. And so as it turned out, um, for the most part, Edinburgh hadn't really excavated anything that was fort related, but secondary structures on the site, the Eagle Hotel and also the Judson House across the street. And I don't think in many cases they went to depths sufficient to reach the colonial level of, you know, the fort occupation. And everything that I saw in the reports and in artifacts was, was consistent with that. Um, some of the maps were in better shape than others. This one had a little water damage and was kind of ripped. Not sure what happened there, but fortunately you can still see most of it here. Um, here's some drawings. These are great in pristine condition. All the files in the file cabinet were outstanding. Just need a little organization. And there's a lot of stuff. And um, various notes. Um, these are just some, I took sample photos, but ended up with a few hundred photos. And um, then also, there was, again, there was a stack of photos in, at Edinburgh. And it's hard to tell, but I'm pretty sure these are from the 1970s excavations or early 80s. And again, there's nothing written on the back of these. They weren't in a folder really that said anything useful. So um, you can see, I presumably field school students having a good time here in an excavation unit, screening, good times. And then this is, um, I can tell where it is. This is kind of the backyard of the Judson house. And if you look back here, where is that one? Ah, here's the Judson house. And then these are excavation units, a long line here. And I was able to, to tell that this is probably that long line of excavation units there. Um, is that slide in there twice? I guess, eh, maybe I just used this picture twice. Again, some more excavation back of the Judson House, probably the 1970s, early 80s. And there was one box that I noticed said possible French and British fort remains. Because most of what was being excavated was 19th century things. And I was hoping, and just out of curiosity's sake at this point, this is well into, well into the project. But I, it was the only box or anything I found that seem to contain anything from the French or British fort. And I was, I tried to track down this excavation unit to see exactly what the, the unit reports said. I wasn't able to find it. And in this box was mostly what appeared to be charcoal. And um, it was kind of hard to tell. I think it was some wood remains and mostly charcoal, but no ceramics, glass, anything like that. And um, there were some interesting 19th century coins, but again, not colonial stuff. But I took some pictures anyways, and these had been stored in a desk drawer, not with the rest of the collection. And some of them had been wrapped in tinfoil, which I had never seen that before. My dad is actually a big coin collector, and um, that's another story. But anyway, I'd never seen this tinfoil thing, but apparently tinfoil over the course of years or decades, this had been wrapped up since the 1970s or 80s, has a mild electrolysis effect on coins, which makes it nice and shiny, but isn't really a good idea for the long-term preservation of coins. So I was able, I wrote better tags, put these in 
curation quality bags and put them in a different place for storage. This guy here is an eagle, flying eagle scent, which are pretty rare. Shield nickel here, a large scent here. And those are all, um, you can see some of the dates, but mid 19th century for the most part. And then here's an example of some of the, um, the contents of the cigar boxes. And so the outside of the boxes do have their writing, which I you saw on a different slide. Inside of the boxes, um, it's inconsistent. These three look pretty similar in that there's some things and then some things in a bag, but that's not really the case. Some of them have these white out with Sharpie on them. Some of them don't. Bags. Some of them have cards and various information inside of them. Most of them don't. And there's really nice, interesting things here, intact items, but um, not really any way to study these because you can't find anything. <laughs> this is another box. These, all these I just opened, I didn't do anything. Just opened them, took a picture and um, for the most part, I think these have been cleaned, but I could tell some things hadn't. So here's kind of a grab bag of what looked to me like some sort of weight. Ceramics, pipe stems, transfer print, Rockingham wear, metal chunks, you name it. And then here's another example. This one had a, uh, an index card in it. Metal. Um, so yeah, some inconsistency here, but um, then this was some of the loose artifacts and then this was in one of the large banker boxes. You see two intact vessels here and then you would some beer bottles and things like that or various bottles just kind of stuck places. And very nice intact uh, Albany slip jug here. More Rockingham wear vessel here, apparently intact. I didn't really handle those to check. Shovel some metal, you name it. So um, this is kind of backtracking. I put a, probably put, a shit to put this slide a little bit earlier, but the Fort LaBeouf Museum had once housed all those, or a lot of those artifacts and worked in conjunction with Edinburgh University. And the professor which had ran those field schools was the curator of the Fort LaBeouf Museum. And in 2010, the state of Pennsylvania decided that there were security concerns at the museum. I think mainly environmental control, but also just security in general. Like it's not a big museum and I don't think they're exactly concerned about things being stolen, but whatever the case, the state pulled all of their artifacts from the museum and put them in the state uh, in the state museum and the Mu Fort LaBeouf Museum was given to the town when it's and it's now ran by the Fort LaBeouf Historical Society and you can read here it's kind of um, kind of uh, laid out here in my notes but the museum currently contains zero artifacts from the fort but it's full of items in all of these um, artifacts and displays now have been obtained from other sources. So not only are the citizens of Waterford, Pennsylvania not able to view the artifacts from the place that you know they is associate with their town, but also artifacts are gotten from somewhere, like some guy. And maybe eBay, hard to tell, who knows. Um, some of them have tags, some of them don't. The current curator um, is extremely knowledgeable, um, is not a computer person. So there's no digital inventory of these items. It's just kind of, um, in his memory, and also recorded by various tags in the museum. Oop, here's a cat, guest presenter. All right. <laughs> um, 
So it's kind of a double-ended problem. Not only are the citizens of Waterford, Pennsylvania, not able to see the artifacts from this, their history, but also you're kind of creating a, a market for artifacts obtained from dubious sources. Um, so it's kind of the, another curation crisis thing there. But it's all very nice items, but they need to be digitally um, digitally recorded. And of course, <laughs> it needs some help. And it would be nice if the state, oh, <laughs> there's a cat. All right, kitty, come on, that's cute, but you know. Um, here's um, one of the really cool things about the uh, Fort LaBeouf Museum across the street. So this is in the back lot of the Daughters of the American Colonists lot here is an interpretive hut. They have a lot of really nice um, uh, things that happen there. So various presentations, um, activities, they do uh, Christmas things. Um, costume interpreters. Here they have they have a working blacksmith. They have a garden here which grows historically accurate um, herbs and spices and various other things. Um, the person that's running this is a retired um, high school history teacher, and he's studied the period extensively. And this garden is based on his best knowledge of what the French and British soldiers would have probably been raising on their own to supplement their, their food sources. It's really neat. And then inside the museum, um, there's a lot of replica things. Most of which, and I don't think anything in this picture is, yeah, maybe a couple of them are old, but mostly replica items. But this is an example of a hearth inside the museum. There's a room that's set to be sort of like a, a living space, a colonial living space from the fort period. And then here's um, a display case. You can see there's artifact tags, which are handwritten. And they do have numbers, but I'm not sure what those correspond to. I haven't seen a spreadsheet or any printed materials. So these may be from somewhere else or from a previous collection that was, so this is just a small case. I don't know if those numbers correspond to any system that the museum currently is, is executing or, or using. Um, on the left is an item that um, my graduate advisor, Dr. Mlischke and I had visited the fort about a year ago. And in the back, in the display case, there's items that just are, um, there's, oh, some random things with small tags. And we saw this one piece of seance sitting there and it was, I was talking to the person that found it. He's like, oh yeah, well, the, the creek behind the museum, when it floods, it kind of washes up some stuff. So I was just back there and picked up this thing. And what that is, is La Rochelle seance, very fancy, very expensive and almost assuredly from the French occupation. And um, a little bit of big man archeology span here, but that plate probably would have been in the room with George, George Washington when he visited, as he would have been a visiting military person. They probably would have used broken out the fine seance for him to eat from. But this is hand painted, very colorful, fancy stuff here. So that was a pretty interesting little find. So they, they're still can, you know, find things on the surface, especially in the creek right behind the fort. And then, um, so that's pretty much, um, pretty much the gist of it. I've got my bibliography here and my figures here. And this actually is kind of a bonus photo here. Inside of the Judson house is a well in the kitchen, an indoor well, which goes down quite a ways, at least 30 feet of the water. And, um, well, most people think that that was probably one of the wells from the fort, which was um, when that house was built in 1808, they probably, the well was still there that they just, you know, repurposed that for and built their house around it. Hard to say, but that's certainly possible. Any questions? Hmm. 
Wow, thank you, Evan. That was great. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in, and then I have a few of my own, so I'll wait for a couple of people um, to start with their own. I have a, a quick question that was just inspired by your last photo. Uh, so is the well, is, does it still have water in it? Yes. It does. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, did you, do you know how far down it was, the water? Um, you can kind of see it in this picture. I would say probably 20 feet to water. Okay. Maybe 30. It's kind of small, I guess, as I would, uh, from what I would think, maybe that's a, an accurate size, but. It's, it's bigger than it looks. Um, okay. It's hard to tell in that picture. I was just trying to gauge off your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it might be in 19th century. Well, it's hard to tell, but that house is right in the middle of where the fort was and there were certainly wells there. I've found various um, anecdotal references to people, them filling in wells and digging up wells, searching for treasure. There was kind of local legends about gold being hidden there from when the French left or when the British left, things like that. And it mentioned specifically um, looking in wells on the site, I had hard to say. That's really interesting. Yeah, wells can tell a lot about a site. Right. Um, I don't know if that was ever excavated. I wasn't able to find anything about that. I doubt if it was, but it would have been certainly disturbed at some point, almost assured. Almost assuredly. Okay, so uh, first question is, how does it feel to um, do all of this research on a French site and not really come across very many French artifacts? <laughs> um, disappointing <laughs> well it, it was over the it was kind of a slow burn it was over the course of a, a long period of time and it was kind of a lemonade at 11 situation um you know i started out my project knowing that things would probably change you just kind of anticipate things like that happening it was a little disappointing um i really love ceramics and i was hoping to find like well that one piece that was just found in the creek behind the fort two springs ago um things like that, but not able to get my hands on it. I know there are some things like that. The uh, One of the Pennsylvania archeologists did email me, I forgot to mention this earlier, did email me two spreadsheets. One was the items that were pulled from the museum, which were colonial things excavated in the 1930s. And the other one was the rest of the collection, which is housed at the state. All of it's housed at the state now, but one was specifically for items that were pulled from the museum. So the stuff is there, but I just haven't been able to get to see it. Um, I've had a lot of trouble um, getting in touch with the State Museum. And I actually, kind of another um, recent discovery, I ran into one of this, another state archeologist at the SHA while doing my poster about this. And he was like, oh, really? Well, let me tell you, and um, had a little bit of news for me and I'm, just in the last couple of days have kind of started um, some emails in hopes of getting up to the State Museum. So hopefully, um, yes, it was definitely disappointing not to be able to look at any French or British artifacts, but they are out there. So maybe one day, or if not me, the next person. <laughs> So I think that uh, your work really highlights the need for collection-based research and, uh, well, some collection work in general and uh, updating some of the things because your site is not like any other, or, well, this collection is not like many others. Um, there are a lot that still are using the index cards. And, um, and I think that from what it sounds like, you, with some hard work, could probably piece together which artifacts are going with there because it looks like they kept a good amount of details that just... Um, might not be stored in a way that's easily accessible, but they are accessible, correct? Yes. Um, the Considering it was field schools and probably mostly utilizing undergraduates, um, I think it's in pretty good shape. It's just, yeah, it needs some time. It needs some work. Um, if one was to, you know, it takes a long time to get that into shape, but all the information is there. It just needs to be organized better. And really, um, you know, the room that it's in is, is quite secure. It's not in the basement. It's not going to flood or anything like that. 
I guess the only real danger is if the um, program is phased out or something like that, and then that collection goes bye bye so that that space is used for something else. Um, curation quality or archival quality bags and boxes could be used, acid free paper, and so on. But it's in pretty good shape. Information's there for sure. Are they, are they letting anyone come in and research it beyond you? Like, would they be open to other people coming to research through that collection or trying to work with it? Yes, I think if anyone um, is interested in that, I could put them in touch with um, Edinburgh University. And um, I don't think they would have any problem with that. They um, were very pleased that I was looking at it. And because, um, you know, it's understood that this is a great collection. There's a lot of a lot of items there. But um, and any any help was appreciated. I did, I did a bunch of stuff there, organized up things and, of course, documented it all. And they were really happy to have any help. So others could certainly do that. OK, cool. Um, just for a small plug on something that I'm slightly involved with is the SHA. They actually have a, a collection curation committee. And they have a dashboard and a survey that anyone that's doing this, they're specifically targeting historic sites, but um, anyone with a collection that is open for research like that, any kind of institution is able to fill out the survey. And then um, that will let other graduate students know that they don't need to excavate, they can do this collection work in different time periods. And then it lets you know, um, you can fill in of how well organized and things like that. So people of different interests can uh, do so maybe that's something they want to look into absolutely excavating the collections um that phrase came up a lot <laughs> <laughs> during during my work um it, it, so, there's probably grants that can be applied for for this for sure oh absolutely yeah. um so connie is asking uh is the museum sustainable uh, related to the sustainability of the Fort LaBeouf Historical Society? And does the university have plans to dedicate resources to further field schools or curation of the collection? The Fort LaBeouf Historical Society runs a museum and they, they have those three buildings that I talked about and a few other um, items on Main Street. Town of Waterford is really small and, and really interesting small town. And um, as far as I know, it's sustainable. Uh, they do get a lot of visitors and they do have um, a pretty popular and well-run Facebook page. A lot of events go on there and a fair amount of visitors. And um, fiscally sustainable, I would say so. I haven't seen their books, but um, I think they're in pretty good shape as far as that goes from just what I've seen and also talking to um, the curator of the museum, who is also the president of the Historical Society. I think they're in pretty good shape. But again, things like this, um, both of the gentlemen that are primary, the vice president and vice president of the, the museum or the Historical Society, um, they're not young. And not a lot of old people are coming into this kind of thing. So uh, if they retire or anything, um, hard to say. So it's definitely something that could use some work and there's a lot of room for uh, <laughs> improvement, not improvement, but it's just something that needs to be looked after and make sure that it's going to be there forever. As far as Edinburgh University's plans to um, further curate the collection or excavate, I would say that's on hold indefinitely. Um, they have no archeology span program currently. And just in the last year, Edinburgh and two other state universities on essentially on the Interstate 79 corridor in Western Pennsylvania have been merged into a larger state university and the department is kind of in peril of being phased out or moved to a different campus or something like that. There's only one, really one person left in anthropology and they're more of a forensics person. So the collection's just kind of sitting there. Um, 
some years ago, moving it or getting rid of it was floated, but I don't think that was a very serious um, talk, but there's not going to be any field schools there in the foreseeable future. Um, other than a few undergraduates doing some random work there, they don't, I don't think they really have any um, immediate plans for the collection. Um, of course, I can't really officially speak for that. Um, but again, I could put anyone in touch with Edinburgh University if they wanted to discuss that with um, people in a position, you know, their authority position. Sure. Um, and that kind of so sidetracks me to two different things. My first one is that if they have an active Facebook page, maybe uh, they could put some of those photos out because that actually has been really helpful to identify people in past photos, um, uh, especially on Facebook. A lot of the uh, over 40, I would say, are becoming more Facebook people than some of the younger generation now. They The younger, have, I get the sense, have moved on to uh, TikTok and Snapchat and all those other things, um, but they might be able to recognize or maybe they'll know somebody and they'll be able, I mean, sharing things like that kind of goes crazy. So that might be an idea. That's a good idea. Um, I'm probably a lot of the people in those photos still live somewhere around and around here. And oh yeah, that was me when I was 20. What a great field school. Yeah. So they might be able to provide some uh, different types of information or other lines of evidence. And then my uh, second kind of question comes from uh, the audience is, is, is um, it kind of stems from their discussion, but so are they calling the collection the Fort LaBeouf collection then, even though it's not really from the fort? Um, are they it's, still referring to it that because it's its kind of historical name, I guess? The, at some point, I think the state had assigned a new site number for the Eagle Hotel and or the Judson House. Um, but the original excavations, every all the drawings, everything is the excavation, or, well, it's 36 ER 65. And um, almost everything has that trinomial on it. But some mm -hmm. of the later items, I think they had gotten a new trinomial assigned for Judson House and or Eagle Hotel. But it's just a higher level on the same site. So um, it's pretty complicated excavation there. And, um, but yeah, by and large, it's, it's really just referred to as the Fort LaBeouf um, collection. But what you saw in that room is almost all 19th century artifacts. <laughs> yeah, it did appear that way. Um, so I, from your discussion, I don't think there's any active interest in Fort LaBeouf at this point. I think that people probably are still generally interested, but maybe not uh, interested in either excavating or that. I mean, I think it seems more like a local interest at this point. Correct? Yeah. Um... When Dr. Malishki, my graduate advisor, um, was with Mercyhurst, we had kind of discussed, or hopefully, you know, we had, when I first came to Mercyhurst, we had talked about maybe trying to excavate there, but paperwork and just, you know, you know the amount of time it would take to make that happen, it never really happened. Uh, Mercyhurst does their field schools elsewhere and has agreements with other parties. So that's a possibility, but again, not in the foreseeable future. And also um, colonial archeology span isn't really, there isn't really anyone at Mercy Earth currently doing colonial archeology span either. Mm -hmm. Is there a cemetery nearby, do you know, that contains burials from the 18th century? Um, at the, Kind of at the end of the street you're looking at here, and then a, two blocks over, there are 19th century burials. I haven't been there to look around if there's any 18th century there. I kind of doubt it. If so, they're very late. Um, the people that were in the fort, they're actually the first few winters there, the French had a lot of their troops die 
of starvation, scurvy, and so on. And no one really knows exactly where they're buried. Some of the maps show um, a burial area, but it seems awfully close to the fort. It's hard to say. And then I've heard some local legends about, oh, well, I know where the bur they're buried. They're up the street here in so-and-so's yard. But because um, this is all neighborhoods, especially back here, pretty much on all sides are private residences. And uh, the museum does own probably 100 yards behind it. And when I took this photograph, I was almost standing on the street. Um, but that's it. So if there are Fort Era burials there, as of yet officially unknown, it may I think be. That I think, Evan, they're probably trying to see the early settler occupation there, too. So trying to trace that back is like the earliest ones that might have been in, in the local cemetery. Local cemetery certainly has people from the early 19th century, maybe late 18th century. No. So not um, contemporaneous with the earliest forts, but the earliest part of the town, certainly. Yes. Sure. Okay, and then um, do you think that any of the materials used to build the hotel have been sourced from the fort or Ooh. some of the buildings from that? Um, you might not know the answer, but what do you think? Good question. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, from what I've read, the fort was almost all wood. I think it's possible if there was some nice, anything nice stonework, it certainly could have been repurposed. That being said, um, the American fort was built in 1794. The hotel was built in 1826. Um, and that house, the Judson house, was built in 1808. And beyond the well, it's, it would be, it's hard to say. I haven't heard of anything like that, but it's certainly popular, possible. Okay. Well, I think we've had a good round of questions tonight, and I don't see any more that I've left unanswered. Um, if I do, please let me know. But thank you so much, Evan. This was a really good discussion. We had a lot of good topics for tonight, a lot of, for, for discussion. So, okay. Um, thank you again for sticking around for the Q&A. Looks like we've got the, all of the questions covered. And thank Great. you for those who participated tonight. Um, we hope that you're able to attend the remaining lectures in the series. Next Thursday at 7 p.m., Gabrielle Nelson and McKenna Schrader will present 3D archaeological walkthrough of Fort St. Joseph. So they're going to talk about their uh, capstone project at Western Michigan and creating this walkthrough for us. Um, you will not want to miss it. It's really cool. I'm very excited about it. So thank you guys and have a great night. Thank you very, very much, everyone.